The history of Wade Park doesn't start actually with the Wade family. It certainly doesn't start with the buildings that we see around us. The real history of Wade Park goes back millions of years. You see, the land that we stand upon here is born of the sediments of ancient seas piled up over millions of millions of years, a vast Devonian ocean that accumulated vast shales and sandstones that lie below our feet. What we don't see in University Circle is the natural landscape that originally attracted people to settlement here. And, and it's, it's worth trying to look at that landscape uh, historically, and, and I think when people walk around the circle today, I think it's worth their while to try to see the remnants of that landscape because they're still here. But what really molded the landscape that we're familiar with today in the Wade Oval area and throughout the Cleveland area was the glaciers. Starting with the Pleistocene era, about a million and a half years ago, there were these giant lobes of glaciers moving across the landscape like bulldozers, pushing debris further and further south, filling in the low places, scouring off the, the top, top places, and basically giving us the soil structure and much of the familiar topography that we see in Cleveland today. The Donebrook watershed, uh, Donebrook, which starts up in Shaker Heights and which finds its way to Lake Erie, was one of the major streams to the eastern part of Cleveland when the area was first settled. So that, that's one component of this puzzle. The, the other part is, is the ridge line, the old shore of Lake Erie, which formed the heights. Uh, most visibly from University Circle, one would see Cleveland Heights. And so you have this old ridge, ridge line, uh, ancient prehistoric ridge line, and you have this, this valley. And, and they determine settlements. These are black oak leaves and some of the largest tree trunks you see behind me here are black oak trees. And the black oak is a type of oak that likes sand barrens. It likes to grow in well-drained soils, sandy soils. And about the only place we find them in northeastern Ohio are on these old ancestral shorelines to the glacial ancestors of Lake Erie. And so it's kind of interesting that even to this day these huge black oaks are markers of the prehistory of Wade Oval. By the 1850s, the families of Doan's Corners became involved with abolitionist activities, such as the Underground Railroad, housing fugitive slaves on their isolated farms, and then transporting them by hay wagon to the last station on the railroad, a barber shop on Lake Erie's shores, and then by boat across the lake to Canada and freedom. We do have independent, at least four different accounts that validate the fact that the Cozads and the Fords uh, housed the fugitive slaves, which was somewhat of a dangerous uh, undertaking because there was the uh, Fugitive Slave Act. The Doan Brook being something that was much more prominent and hard to ford was your barrier of, of keeping this area safe for housing the slaves temporarily because of the, 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 the so bounty hunters coming from so Cleveland. It's an isolated, it's an isolated well, area. It, well, and it was, yeah, it was away from downtown, four miles away. One property remains in University Circle to recall the neighborhood's agricultural and abolitionist history. The Cozad Farmhouse, built in 1854, is situated behind the larger and more ornate Cozad Bates House that was built in 1875 and is located at the corner of Mayfield Avenue and East 115th Street. The house that still strikes me in, in this neighborhood is, is the Cozad Bates house because it's a survivor. And, and the back part of, of that house possibly was used to hold slaves who were coming north to Cleveland on the Underground Railroad. So that structure is a real reminder not only of the farm community but of the fact that, that there was a strong antipathy towards slavery. Public art, of course, does not just exist outside in public spaces, but it also adorns the interiors of many buildings and institutions, such as Case Western Reserve University, University Hospitals, the Cleveland Clinic, and many others. 
one exciting collection of art was assembled by the faculty of the Macromolecular Science and Engineering program at Case Western Reserve University. A work by local artist Chris Pico is featured in the program's conference room. It, it's a piece that Professor Hilton and myself see every day when we meet in here and it grows and grows and grows and uh, right. I, uh, we receive a lot of compliments and uh, uh, sometimes they say, what is it? What you do here is work on ideas and look into things and try to come up with solutions and, and new ways of using materials. So uh, the fragment of thought is here when you're first ex exploring something. And at that fragment of thought then enters into this domain where there are two hands who are working in unison. It, it's a symbol for cooperation. As more of this investigation takes place, time passes. And these larger circles are symbols of the passage of time. And as that time passes, you're learning more and more about what it is you're exploring, and the language gets stronger. And the final hand here is raised almost like it's stop, you need to go no further. Uh, we've reached a conclusion, and the eyes on that hand are symbols of awareness. So I call that last hand the, the hand of awareness. So finally, the thought has, has gelled, and you have a solid piece of knowledge to work from. I know very few outstanding works of art that try to describe the creative process like you just did and also in your beautiful work.